Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. You look good today. It's a good day to be gathered together, to worship together, to hear from the Lord together. And as we do so, we open our hearts. We pray, Lord God, that you would inspire us and work within us and move us. Lord, may we feel the embrace of your love and comfort and compassion, not only through the touch of the Spirit, but through our fellowship with one another. We love you. Amen. Well, as we do each week, we invite you to stand as you're able to join us in this call to worship. Melissa, my wife, will come and lead us. <laughs> this is my wife, Melissa. <laughs> come on up. <laughs> it's okay. As you all know, <laughs> um, it says, share something that's inspiring me. And so I was just thinking, what is? And um, I have this love-hate relationship with my garden. <laughs> and I went out yesterday morning because it was kind of cool and uh, like cooler than it has been and started working and after about an hour and a half i was like i hate this garden i just it has bindweed everywhere and thistles and the mint is overgrown and everything is in places it's not supposed to be and i was like i am never gonna get this cleaned up this is just like an endless disaster of my garden but i also love it and um, and so I was like, I can't do this. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and I'm like breaking down, just like we should sell our house <laughs> right she now. She goes all the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just just stayed out there, and I stayed out there. And I ended up working out there from like 8 to 5 p.m. yesterday. I did eat occasionally, but, um, and like by 5 o'clock, like I could, I was like, wow, it's not so bad. I made progress. The weeds are like, at least for now, you can't see them. <laughs> I pulled them off the top. And so I just am endlessly inspired by just how our lives are so much like a garden and how the bindweed like tries to grow up and choke us out and and we just have to be diligent in clearing it away and trusting in God and in the seasons and knowing that there is times of abundance and times of letting go and times of rest and um, and by the end of the day, I was like, oh, I think we can stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so sorry for that long inspiration. Now, please join me in our call to worship. Um, lift up your voice and call out to God. We, we cry, cry out, out believing, believing that, that God, God hears, hears us. us. Come together and wait for God. We come together trusting that God is still speaking. Surely God's presence is here with us now. We wait in hope for God's steadfast love lifts our hearts. Come, worship the Lord. We celebrate the power of God that restores us. Thank you.
Amen, Lord. We're so grateful and we proclaim this morning, Lord, that you are the cornerstone of our lives. God, we recognize that in moments when the things we've set in place as assurances, the things that we've set in place as confidences fail us or fall short. <laughs> Whether it's the relationships that we hold on high, perhaps the performance of the stock market, <laughs> perhaps when our car breaks down, whatever it is, God, we recognize that the one true thing that we can see in life as our solid rock is you. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Church, I invite you to reflect on that in a moment of silence. Let's give the Lord our thanksgiving, our adoration, perhaps our shortcomings, perhaps our weaknesses, our mistrust. Place these things before the Lord. you are kind and compassionate, closer than a brother. God, in this moment, we ask that you would help us to be aware of your presence. Church, I invite you to join me in our corporate prayer this morning. This prayer will be on the screens. Please join me as we pray. Merciful God, we try to hide from your presence, knowing that we have traded your abundant life for the scarcity of sin. We have not followed your will, but instead heed other voices and pursue our own desires at the expense of others. Forgive us so that we can live with ourselves, with others, and with you. You alone can restore us. In steadfast love, look upon us and reclothe us in your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 offers good news. Brothers and sisters, do not lose heart. We are being renewed day by day through the grace of Christ extended to us. This is good news. Please join me in saying thanks be to God.
Psalm 130 expresses this thought. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord. More than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin.
thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We are going to turn and pass the peace and welcome each other and greet each other in the name of the Lord. morning, sir. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> We're hot. Morning, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, for those of you who I have not met, my name is Jesse. So, greetings to everybody. Um, thanks for being here this morning on this very humid Florida day. Um, I'm going to share some announcements and then lead us into some scripture. So first and foremost, there is a courtyard cookout. We're doing this, I think, monthly, right? Um, every, every month we'll do one on a Tuesday. This one is coming up on June 11th, 6 p.m. So it's right out here in our courtyard. Um, we have the grills and yard games, so just bring, um, bring your main dish that you can grill for your family and then something to share with everyone else. Um, and you can bring friends and, you know, bring, bring more people. <laughs> 
Um, we also have the Walker Hymn Sing. That's in your bulletin if you want more information. That's coming up on Saturday, June 15th, um, down near Timnath, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Also, the Nazarene District Assembly is coming up. Um, it's a weekend, Thursday and Friday, June 20th and 21st. Um, all of our Colorado Nazarene churches are gathering uh, for just business and also worship and meetings together. And you are invited to join. Um, it's hosted in Littleton. So there are more details on that in your bulletin as well. And finally, there is our annual hike that we have done for a few years now, coming on Sunday, June 23rd, right after church. So maybe bring a change of clothes. Um, we'll meet at the Hewlett Gulch Trail, which is really pretty. It's up um, the canyon. And it's a pretty relaxing hike, so don't, don't worry too much. It's family friendly. Bring water, snacks, sunscreen, probably bug spray, um, and a swimsuit, apparently, if you would like to play in the water. So <laughs> come prepared. There are restrooms at the trailhead, and like I said, bring all ages. It's um, accessible for everyone. And that's, again, on June 23rd. All right, that's all the announcements, so I'm going to lead us um, in a little scripture from Mark 1, 16 through 20. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon Peter and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. This is the word of God for the people of God. So the question for us this morning is, who are you following? Who are you following? Everyone is following somebody or something. So put another way, everyone is a disciple. Everyone is being discipled. The question isn't, are you a disciple? Are you being discipled? It's who or what are you a disciple of? As we heard in our scripture just moments ago, Jesus gave an invitation, come and follow me. He invited anyone, everyone, to become his followers, his disciples, learning his way of living and learning a new way of being human. Over the past 2,000 years, millions of people have heard and responded to this call to follow Jesus. Doing so not only changes our lives, changed their lives, but truly it's changed the course of human history. You've likely heard these words before, follow Jesus. But what exactly does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? Does it mean that we believe a set of ideals called Christianity? Does this mean that we go to church on Sundays or we try really hard to just be a good person? And this raises another question. How do we follow Jesus in our modern world? It's one thing for Simon and Andrew and James and John to follow Jesus. They could see him and actually respond to him in his body. But how do we follow Jesus in our modern world when we're so busy and hurry is a distraction in so much of our lives where burnout really almost seems like a rite of passage? Anxiety is like an electric pulse that just keeps us going. If we didn't have it, we might just crash and burn. What does it look like to follow Jesus today? Well, this is, the this is the question that we hope to wrestle with a bit this summer that we're going to be asking ourselves over the next handful of weeks. During the summer, our normal Christian calendar following of the, the lectionary and our Christian holidays, it enters into a season called ordinary time or kingdom time. And the number of feasts that we have, like Christmas and Lent and Easter and Pentecost, they're spread out a little bit wider. And so during this season, 
we consider some of these big picture ideas of what living a life in Christ really means. Perhaps you might even say we kind of take a step back and we go back to basics. We kind of look at what are the roots and the foundations of our life in Christ. So over these next handful of weeks, we'll be asking ourselves this question, not likely for the first time we've heard this question, and it won't be the last time that we deal with this question in our lives. But the question is simply, what does it look like to follow Jesus today for me, for you, Most of what we're going to be covering, and indeed the outline of really our times together, is coming from a book that I read that was very inspiring. It's a book by John Mark Comer called Practicing the Way. There's a little blurb of that in your worship notes. If you're looking for a good read, I'd really encourage you to pick it up. Last summer, we spent a little time from this book... um, following some of the practices, the observances of what it means to live life in Christ. And those observances that we followed last summer became the inspiration for this book, which was published earlier this year. I'd recommend you pick up a copy and follow along or just commit to coming and plugging in here and just kind of hearing what we have to say over the next handful of weeks. Our goal is to lay out for ourselves a foundation upon which we can begin a lifelong journey of apprenticing with Jesus. You may be here, and this idea of apprenticing is new to you, or perhaps you've been a Christian for much of your life, and so you've steadily become deeper, more and more an apprentice, a disciple, a follower of Jesus, or perhaps you're a pretty serious follower of Christ, but you want to learn more about the practices that Jesus engaged in in his lifestyle and engaged and how those might plug into your life. So over the next few weeks, there'll be much for all of us as we listen to the teaching and the practices and the reflections and dialogue of what it means to truly follow Jesus. So let's circle back to that story we heard at the opening Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee when he comes upon Simon and Andrew, two brothers, running a fishing business off of the beach. And Jesus calls, and they left their nets at once and followed him. You know, we've heard this story so many times. It has become very familiar. I think in some cases it's easy for us to lose kind of the perspective of what's going on here. As a matter of fact, the story kind of seems pretty bizarre to us. What would make Simon and Andrew drop everything? I mean, literally walk out on their family business with no advanced planning, all to follow an unknown rabbi with no income, no organization, and not even a home. He's calling these two into a life of uncertainty What is he offering that's so compelling to Simon and Andrew that they would jump at the chance? A little backstory helps fill in the gaps for us. In first century Israel, you would regularly see rabbis walking along the road and teaching at your village or synagogue. The word rabbi simply means teacher, and rabbis were revered in culture, not just for their knowledge of the Torah or Bible, but really for showing what it really means to live a life devoted to God. Each rabbi had their own way of saying and doing things, their own way of interpreting, their own way of living the life of God out. And so these rabbi gained gained kind of uh, a following, kind of gained renown. Most of them were itinerant. In other words, they didn't stay in one place for long. They would go from temple to temple, synagogue to synagogue, and they would teach. They would travel from place to place. And behind them, as they traveled, would be a small group of students called a Talmudim. The Hebrew word Talmudim literally means learner. But it can also be translated as a student or follower. The most common translation that we hear for this word is disciple, but a growing number of Bible scholars, kind of the more modern translations, 
argue that the best word that we have in English for what it means to be a Talmudim is an apprentice. The philosophy of education in the ancient world was nothing like what we experience today in the West, where you go to class and you sit through lectures and you kind of gain information, you take notes, and then you're tested upon that information. Education in the ancient world, it was not informational, it was formational. The goal wasn't to learn about something, but to become someone. And discipleship or apprenticeship was the pinnacle of the first century Jewish education system. So to be the apprentice or the Talmudim of a rabbi was everyone's top priority. Jewish kids started school around the age of five years old, much like we do today, and they would enter into the Beit Sefer, which literally means the house of the book. Um, it was the equivalent of our kind of primary or elementary school. The primary text was the Bible, the Torah, but it was an oral culture. So not every kid had to get their own copy from the bookstore. Instead, by the age of 12 to 13, these students would be expected to have memorized the entire Torah, the entire first five books of the Bible. That's just kind of how it worked. That's what you did in school. At that point, the vast majority of students then would be released to return home to the family trade, to go back to the family business, to work on the family farm. Meanwhile, the best of the best students would go on to a second level of education called Beit Midrash, or the house of learning, where they would continue their studies of the Old Testament scriptures. By the age 17, these students will have memorized the entire Old Testament scripture. At this point, again, the vast majority would be done. They would be released to go into society and to to be followers of Christ in their trade and in their practices, but the best of the best of the best would go on to become apprentices under the rabbi who had been teaching, to follow the rabbi, to live with them, to listen to their teaching, to spend every waking moment and every sleeping hour with them. And this was the highest ideal for Everyone in the Hebrew society at the time, it was like winning the lottery to make it this far and to be chosen by a rabbi, as this might lead to becoming a rabbi yourself, the highest ideal in society. The fact that Simon and Andrew were fishing shows that at some point they didn't make the cut. At some point they were left out. They had been passed by, unrecognized. They had apparently reached their peak, and so they returned to the family business. That is, until Jesus comes along and calls their name. And so Simon and Andrew did exactly what any other Hebrew kid would have done if they had been chosen. They dropped everything to reform their lives entirely in order to follow Jesus. And as you followed a rabbi, as you were the apprentice or the Talmudim of a rabbi, really there were those three things that you were to do. First, you were to be with your rabbi. Second, you were to become like your rabbi. And third, so that you could do the things that your rabbi was doing. So first, to be with a rabbi, they left everything, their family, their village, and they followed their rabbi 24-7. Apprenticeship was deeply relational. They would walk behind their rabbi on the road. They would eat every meal with them. They would keep the Sabbath together. They would be with them all day long. They would become like their rabbi. The heart and soul of apprenticeship was to be with your rabbi for the purpose of becoming like them. You would actually begin to imitate every aspect of their life. You would imitate their mannerisms, their figures of speech. You wanted to be like your rabbi. And finally, you would do as your rabbi did. The goal of apprenticeship to the rabbi was to, apprenticeship to a rabbi was to become a rabbi yourself one day. And if you made it through the long process of apprenticeship, 
Then, when your rabbi felt you were ready, he would turn to you and he would say something like, okay, I think it's time. Go and make disciples in the nations. Go and do the things that I did. Live the way that you saw me live. Bloom, blossom, and bear good fruit. This was what it meant to be a disciple. And this is still what it means to be a disciple of Christ today. For much of us, our experience doesn't always reflect this, however. Somehow, the modern church system has boiled this down into some other things, distractions perhaps. But in our own way here 2,000 years after Simon and Andrew, we strive to chase after these same three simple things with sensitivity and with understanding to our time and our place in history and culture, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Jesus himself called his disciples to be with him, to follow him, to live with him. You know, there's a Dutch monk named Thomas Akempis. He called this familiar friendship with Jesus. Jesus himself said to his apprentices, I have called you friends. And through friendship with Jesus, we enter into an inner life with God himself. We're invited in to a sacred mystery, the Trinitarian community of love. You've experienced this perhaps when a friend invites you to supper or to a meal and you see what their life is like. You see the way they interact with one another, with their family, perhaps other friends they've invited, and it's kind of all magical and wonderful. Through Jesus, we are enveloped in the love and joy and peace that is flowing between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We live in connection to this love. Jesus called this abiding with him. We've been talking about this quite a bit over the last few weeks. Being with Jesus has a lot of names. Abiding, perhaps. The French contemplative Madame Goyon called this continuous inner abiding. The pastor, A.W. Tozer, called it constant conscious communion. That's a bit of a tongue twister. But probably my favorite comes from Brother Lawrence, who called it the practice of the presence of God. Brother Lawrence famously was a Catholic monk who spent his time serving most of his life in the kitchens of his monastery, washing dishes and taking out the garbage, practicing the presence of God in the midst of that work. We can live this way in connection to Jesus, but unlike Simon and Andrew, we can't simply walk behind Jesus on the dusty roads and watch his mannerisms and hear his speech for us. It takes a bit more practice to turn our mind and our heart to God all throughout the day. Contemporary theologian Dallas Willard, a teacher on this process that we call spiritual formation, says this, the first and most basic thing that we can and must do is to keep God constantly before our mind. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. To consider the ways of God and to keep that relevant in the midst of our day to day. One part of this practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our mind constantly towards the way of Christ. And as we learn to follow Jesus, we may well start then seeing changes or we may begin challenging our burdensome habits, our quirks and our ways of life, the things that cause us harm and pain and perhaps harm and pain to others, the things that pull us away from God. But like learning anything new, it takes time and effort and it doesn't come without some soreness and some challenge. But over time, through those growing pains and through that effort, new grace-filled habits and priorities and emphasis and 
direction for our lives begins to replace those former things that used to harm us. Soon our minds will return to God as a needle of a compass returns to north. As a matter of fact, this idea of apprenticeship or, or the spiritual formation, the practices, this is a bit like reorienting what the North Pole or the North Star in our life really is. It's refocusing our inward motivations. This is the first step of being apprentice to Christ, is being with Jesus. Our next goal is to become like Jesus. This is the bleeding heart of apprentice, to be transformed from the inside out like Jesus, to feel like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, to live and to love like Jesus did. Jesus himself had a great way of saying this in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. He said, students are not greater than the teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. Notice this language is not passive. You know, there's very intentional language. Anyone who is fully trained will become like their teacher. In other words, this is a process that we're being invited into None of us become like Jesus in a flash through a heartfelt prayer, through a moment of divine encounter. It sure gets the ball rolling, but for most of us, this is an effort-long process, a lifelong process. The term we use for this process, again, is spiritual formation. This simply means the process by which our spirit and our innermost man or woman is transformed, being formed more into the likeness of Jesus himself. So first, we must know pretty intimately and completely what Jesus is like through our time of being with him. But then we can begin to imagine what Jesus would look like expressed through our individuality, our personality, our gender, our ethnicity, our stage of life, through our culture, through our society. I would argue that Jesus would look a little bit different if he were among us today than he did 2,000 years ago. The things that he's facing and experiencing are different. And so that's an interesting process. What would it look like for Jesus to live through me in these situations. And this is the second goal of being a disciple or apprentice of Jesus, to being like him. And finally, as followers of Jesus, our last goal is to do as he did. Remember Jesus' invitation, come, follow me. It had an end result in mind. He said, and I will send you out to be fishers of men. You know, in English, this sounds like some kind of weird cheesy pun of what it means, like fishing for men. But being fishers of men, fishers of people, this phrase was a first century idiom for what it meant to be a great rabbi. Because as great rabbis lived and spoke and taught and experienced, they were so magnetic, they were so compelling that people were drawn to them like fish to a net. This is what it meant to be fishers of men, to be compelling and beautiful, spicy in some cases, the thing that draws people to you. Jesus is saying, come and follow me, and I'll train you, I'll help you to be this way. Think about it. If you're an apprentice to a plumber, then at the end of your apprenticeship program, your goal isn't just to know everything about plumbing, it's to be able to actually plumb a house, right? In the same way, the goal of apprenticeship under Jesus isn't just to know all there is to know about Jesus, but it's to be able to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. We're called to join Jesus in his work in this world, to see freedom come from the pain and the sufferings that we all endure, to see relief from injustice, and to begin to fix the little things that we can fix. Small, perhaps, little to start, but ultimately, the big things. This may sound impossible, 
may sound challenging or daunting, not even worth trying. But as you are with Jesus and you become more like Jesus, you will naturally find yourself saying and doing the kinds of things that Jesus said and did. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and to do as he did. The first followers of Jesus called themselves the way, or followers of the way. Thank you, Jay. This is the way. The way of Jesus is not just assent to a set of beliefs. It's not just believing in the right theology. It's not even just a philosophy of life. It's the whole thing. And it's not just a moral system. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's a way of life based on that of the life of Jesus himself. To apprentice under Jesus is to practice his way. This is where we're going to be this summer over these next handful of weeks. This beginning is kind of the enticing, the, the opening part of this, but we're going to got, dive in deeper. We're going to go in deep on certain of these topics, and we're going to spend time looking at the practices of Jesus. And as we do so, each week I'm going to be offering you a practice that you can begin to enact in your life. You can see this in your worship folder. You'll see this in your notes. We have a practice of developing a daily prayer rhythm. Each week as we dive deeper into this, we're going to be focusing on a practice, something that we can actually do and test, something that we can work on, we can train on. And this week, the best way to practice being with Jesus is to develop a daily rhythm of prayer. You'll see this on your worship folder, as I mentioned. No matter your relationship with prayer, it is central to being with Jesus. Our goal is to begin working on and flexing this muscle that's central to our faith in God. This exercise can be done in a few spare moments that you grab as you walk from place to place, or perhaps you're going to invest a little bit of devoted special time, an hour or so. Either way, the key is to start where you are, not where you feel that you should be. I think that's oftentimes the thing that gets us as we follow Christ, especially in the context of church. If two to three minutes is all you have, start there and then take the next step. I like to take advantage of my commute in the mornings on my way to and from places. It's one of my favorite moments in the day. It's quiet, the solitude. In the morning, I don't turn on music. I don't catch up on podcasts. I don't I try to refrain from not catching up on one more chapter of whatever book I'm listening to. I simply drive. I simply let the silence be there. I try to listen. I try to be with God. I try to recognize what it is I'm feeling. In some cases, I might actually pray <laughs> as I do that. Your time with Jesus might begin with making a perfect cup of coffee or tea. You might begin by praying a psalm such as Psalm 23 or reading another scripture, whatever it is, you begin to structure this time. And there are four kind of core components to developing this practice. There's four things that are important to making this stick. One, identifying the place, the place in which you will pray. Finding a place is important Sometimes we need something away from our normal locations in order to pray well. Second, identify a time. Try to be consistent with a time. The Talmudim of Jesus prayed three times daily. There were three set times of prayer. Even today, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in the area of Jerusalem, the area of these devout followers of Christ, you'll see people walking down the street and their watch goes off, and they'll stop on the street and begin praying, kind of rocking back and forth even with their body. So finding a time in which you commit to prayer. Then you enter into the quiet. You do this through the details given in your worship folder. And finally, you open your heart to God in prayer. You know, this may feel unfamiliar as you begin. You may 
not know where to start. You don't have to start from scratch. For thousands of years, the followers of Jesus have prayed the Psalms, a collection of poetic prayers in the middle of our Bible. These are the guided prayers of the followers of Christ, the Jews, the Hebrews. The Psalms were designed to be actively prayed and recited, not just read. So when you're struggling to pray, the Psalms give us a good structure, a good starting point. Perhaps you might start with Psalm 1, or you could use the Psalm that we heard today, Psalm 130. The importance is not the length, the depth of the time with God. It's about making it happen. It's about the consistency. You know, the spiritual journey will involve our entire lifetime. As we deepen and widen ourselves, being transformed more into friendship with Jesus. You know, it's interesting that Jesus never said these words. He never invited people into a new religion called Christianity. He simply invited people into a way of living and being with him, to following him. You know, in America, in our culture, in our context, an average of 63% of people still identify as Christian. This varies widely, especially based on generation. But that number is still huge. 63% of our culture identifies as Christian. But when you begin to take a deeper look, there's been numerous studies and surveys on these followers of Christ, where they've asked, are you actually doing the things of Jesus? Like, what does that look like? Tell me about the week. And as you begin to really dive in, you notice that most people are not necessarily living this way. Kind of that number from 63% narrows all the way down to about 4 to 5% are living a life vitally involved in the work of Christ. In other words, many people identify as Christian, but few are actually living as disciples. Returning to Dallas Willard again, uh, one of my heroes in this space, he says this, the greatest issue facing the world today with all of its heartbreaking needs is whether those who identify as Christian will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens in every corner of human existence. I think as we do so, we would see dramatic things happening, not only in our own hearts, but in our circumstances and our situations. I think that you are up for it. I think you're ready. That's why you're here. You're here today. You're the 4% and growing. Well, as we follow this rabbit trail this summer, um, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are. Um, This is really an invitation into what I feel like personally is the thing that makes me alive in the life of Christ. I love the fact that not only do we get to hear and retell the stories and learn deeper revelations about what it meant to be with Jesus and the things that Jesus did and the things that God is calling into our world, but we actually get to step in and engage in doing these things. You may be thinking, it sounds fine for you, pastor. You're a pastor. It's your profession. This is what you get paid for. But... It's only until recently that this has been what I've been paid for. This has been the way I've lived my whole life up until two years ago when I stepped in as your pastor. Most of my life was just doing this just like you guys do on nights and weekends and in the moments in between. God is good and gracious. He blesses every effort. And whether you're feeling excited and rejuvenated, maybe you're feeling kind of jaded, or I've heard this before, I've tried this before, it just doesn't stick. Perhaps you're feeling kind of horrified at the idea. 
May God bless us as we learn to be like Jesus, to be with Jesus, to do the things that he did. May God bless us in giving ourselves the grace to learn and to grow in these areas. May God bless us by, through our love and our actions, he encourages and touches others. Amen. Amen. Well, as we do each week, we're going to gather around this table. We're going to participate in receiving the Lord's Supper, the same supper that he shared with his Talmudim in that room centuries ago. And we enact this each week as a way of responding to the things that God is stirring on our hearts. For those worshiping at home, now is an appropriate time to gather elements that represent the body and blood of Christ. We invite you to join us. Come, whoever you are, wherever you come from, you are welcome here. Come, those who have much and those who have little, those who are strong and those who are weak, those who know much about God and those who are just beginning to learn, those who have come to church your whole lives and those who may be here for the very first time. This is the Lord's table. The same Jesus Christ who took on the sin of the world in his death welcomes all people to come to taste and to see that God is good. The God who created us, the God who forgives us and takes care of us, the God who calls us to wholeness and everlasting life. Communion is a reminder of what God has done through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. But we also believe that communion is even more than a reminder. It's a sacrament, a means of receiving into our lives the grace that God freely gives to all. So now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we share in this bread and this cup. We celebrate the love that binds us, not only to Christ, but to one another as a family of God. And so it is all who trust Jesus, whether a little or a lot, and those who would like to trust him more are invited to come and to be a part of this feast which he has prepared for us. As we gather at this table, we do so saying these words that represent the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In just a moment, I'll prepare the elements for us to receive. We'll invite you to come down the center aisle with open hands. We'll place a piece of bread saying the body of Christ broken for you. You can then dip that bread in the cup. We'll say the blood of Christ shed for you. We do have individual cups if you prefer. These elements are gluten-free. Come, let us join the Lord at his table.
having experienced together the generosity of Christ by gathering at his table, we enact that same generosity in our lives through our devotion and through our giving. Thank you so much for those of you who continue to steadfast and steadily support this ministry. We're so grateful. Thank you for those who have been giving in extra ways to our care fund. Uh, we're looking forward to distributing that this next couple of weeks. So thank you for those who have given in that way. If you still feel desire, you can mark giving as care, and this will go directly towards serving the needs of one another here in this congregation. Oftentimes I pray this just myself, but I'll invite you to pray this with me today. Let's pray this prayer of generosity. It'll be on the screens for us together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have and laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay but will shine in the age to come. Amen. Amen. Church, I invite you to remain in a posture of prayer as Bob comes to lead us in our prayers of the people. invite you to find your favorite posture of prayer. We will conclude our prayer time by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as you? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people. What praises belong to you? You formed the mountains by your power, and with your mighty strength, you quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. What joy for those you bring near, those who live in your presence. What festivities await us there? You guide us along right paths, bringing honor to your name. Even when we walk through the darkest valley, we will not be afraid, for you are close beside us. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will lead us all the days of our lives, and we will live in your presence forever. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, so we take time to thank you for all you have given to us. We thank you this morning especially that you gave us the example of Jesus, who truly shows us the way. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through the beauty and complexity of nature. In the Bible, your written word in the relationships we have with other Christians, and all the other ways we can sense and experience your presence with us. We are grateful for, trans for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, enabling us to become more and more like Jesus. We thank you for those in places who have responded to your call and followed you. Through their obedience and the power of the Spirit, a community of love and faith has been gathered to worship and serve you. We rejoice and are humbled by the opportunity to be part of your people at Emmaus Road, with whom we can serve together our world and community as you did. Reflect for a moment and consider all the good things that God has done for you and give thanks.
Lord, most of all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, who was born in human form and humbled himself to die a criminal's death on a cross, who was raised to new life, and who became like us so that we might become like him and be brought into the loving fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, you told us that if we ask for anything according to your will, you will provide what we need. So we offer you our request. Thank you, Lord, that you have shown us the way. Jesus has become our North Star. Help us find you. Help us, Lord, to hear your call in our lives. Give us ears to hear and hearts to love and the will to respond in faith. By your Spirit, fashion our lives according to the example of your Son and grant that we may show the power of your love to all people among whom we live. Lead us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Search our hearts, Lord, examine us and show us our fears and insecurities. Point out anything that offends you and lead us along your path of everlasting life. God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and respect and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. We pray for all those in our church and in our families who are in many ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or situation. Comfort and relieve them according to their needs and give them patience under their sufferings. Bring healing and health to them and be with all those who provide their care. Let us take a moment to add our own silent request to these that have been mentioned. And now, Lord, as members of your kingdom, we remember and we pray together the prayer you taught your first disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. My name's Keely, for anybody that doesn't know me. And um, <clears throat> I'm excited. I saw that Jay is really excited about going into this uh, Practicing the Way of Jesus um, series that we're getting ready to start. And um, I don't know if anybody else was in the same boat, but when you hear that word practice, does anybody else finish that with makes perfect? <laughs> Right. Or there's different versions of it. Practice makes better. The one that I use in my classroom is practice makes permanent. Um, the idea that we're aiming towards mastery and that practice leads us to mastery. But 
my sister and I were having a really interesting conversation on Friday um, about the idea of perfection um, and um, the, if you, sorry, I'm a word nerd. So if you look at the Latin influences in the word perfect, it means to like make complete or to make whole. Um, doesn't necessarily mean without flaw, just means to make complete. And the Greek word that's used um, in the Bible is teleos. Uh, I learned this from my sister Erin on Friday. And Greek philosophers have talked about how the idea of perfection, the idea of teleos, is that something reaches its state of perfection or teleos when it is fulfilling its purpose, um, that it's been designed for. So a chair is perfect because it's designed um, to sit in, and that's what allows it to be perfect. And we have been designed to live the way that Christ has lived. And so when we practice, we are practicing for the fulfillment of what we have been designed for. Um, so I'm excited to go into this series as well. Um, uh, so I now invite you to hold out your hands as we receive this commission inspired by our worship today. Go now, follow where Christ calls you, and proclaim the message God gives you. Wait in hope for God. Avoid becoming bound up in the business of the world, but live in readiness for the inbreaking of the kingdom. And may God be your haven and your glory. May Christ Jesus give you courage for his mission. And may the Spirit embrace your soul in God's silence. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. As always, we finish with singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. dismissed. Have a wonderful week.